All right. Today is Thursday, October 26th, 2023, New York City. Welcome to Alimony, Ali, Mayor of New York. I believe this is maybe number 15, but these are my thoughts on what I would do if I was mayor of New York. And to reiterate, I really don't want to be mayor of New York. I don't really want to be a politician, although it might be cool to do it in a movie or a TV show. I would like that. And if at some point something happened, maybe something could change. Maybe I'd go, wow, some people are listening to this and they're saying, hey, great ideas. You should run. Maybe. I guess anything is possible. Today, um, believe it or not, is my birthday. This is 55. Hard to believe. I came to Earth in 1968 and now 55 years has passed doesn't feel like it. I feel okay. I've got some pain in my right foot. Um, take care of your feet, people, your feet and your teeth if you can afford it. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any type of dental care you can get for free. New York City continues to deal with its challenges in a post-COVID world and a migrant crisis world and a world at war. As I speak now, the world is at war. Um... There is the war on Ukraine imposed by the leader of Russia. There is the war in the Middle East um, that is bad, approaching genocide, if it hasn't already passed that. Um, But again, this is not about naming names or talking about those topics. That might be a different podcast where I do something called Crazy Big Ideas, where In that podcast, I talk about how do we find peace in the Middle East. This one primarily should be about New York City and how to make New York City the best we can. And I'm recording in New York York City right now, 29th between 6th and 7th at our little comedy theater. You can hear the sirens outside. You can hear the people beeping as they back up outside. There's a public storage facility across the street from us, 17 stories up three stories below ground because below ground you don't have to pay property tax. I learned that while they were building the building. I thought about this the other day. Ultimately, the best thing New York City can do for the tri-state area, for the East Coast, for America and the world is to be the greatest city in the world. That really is what every town, village, hamlet, city can do for the world is to be the best, to be the greatest, to strive for that. And every city should think they're the greatest city in the world. I think that because I live in New York. I've been to other cities and I've enjoyed my time there, but every city in a non-fascist, patriotic, overly arrogant way should think this is the greatest city in the world I live in. This is the greatest town in the world. This is the greatest little village in the world. And aspire to do that. And again, there's many things I've probably said before, and I'll say again. They used to say in Rome, if you keep your stoop clean, the rest of Rome will remain clean. And that's what we have to do. We have to endeavor to keep our stoops clean. Now, I mean, many people in New York City live in apartment buildings, so, I mean, I guess it's keeping outside your front door clean. But also, as you're leaving your home, going to the bus, subway, walking somewhere, if you see a piece of garbage, bend down, pick it up. Put it in the garbage can. One, two, three pieces. Think of it as exercise. Don't think of it as something that makes you less than, you know. And I also thought of a good term, you know. I mean, I was having struggling, you know, in terms of what do I call garbage men because I have seen women, garbage women, um, sanitation workers, sanitation craftspeople, I think is the word that I found. So the word garbage is not in there. Sanitation engineers sanitation workers, but whatever you say, as long as it's not really what we say, it's how we say it. So I was trying to find the right term because at the end of the day, they're on the front lines. The people who pick up the garbage in this city, if they did not do their jobs, we would know immediately within days, within a week, it would be chaos within a month. My gosh, it would be piled up everywhere. It would be a bonanza for the rats and the mice and the bugs. So, you know, they're, they're up there. 
I mean, obviously you need the first responders. If they didn't do their job, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Firefighters, police officers, EMTs, paramedics, um, bus drivers, subway conductors. We would know. Um, we would feel those effects immediately. And I think that's the way to judge or to look at who is really keeping these cities running. But I think New York City, by trying to be the greatest city in the world. And what does that mean? It means on a basic level, as I said, my platform, and I'll say this maybe every time. And I hope it's taken by other towns and villages and hamlets and cities globally. It's simple to translate. Clean streets, safe streets, free streets. We know what clean means. But walking to work today, I saw a lot of concrete sidewalks that were crapped, cracked, that they had trip hazards, that they really are going to end up costing you. This is where a stitch in time saves nine, that old adage from colonial times. When you see you need a stitch in an item of clothing or sock, if you don't put that stitch in and let that stitch in that hole grow, it will grow to now you need nine stitches in order to save that pair of pants. But if you had taken and fixed it when it was one stitch, a stitch in time, Saves nine. So if we don't fix the cracked sidewalks, what's going to happen is someone's going to slip and trip, and then we're going to have our courts filled with slip and trip lawsuits. Also, it's a good thing to do. Now, I know, as I've said, the sidewalks are the responsibility of the landlords for the most part. Some parts of it the city takes care of. And I don't know how you make sure it gets done. I'm sure there are people going around and giving tickets for cracked sidewalks. And I'm sure, you know, I said the other day that 311 had sometimes become a snitch line. But again, I don't want to like, I don't want to demonize people who call because there's a problem and say you're a snitch. I I think, you know, there is a place for that. And used properly, 311 can definitely benefit the city of New York. And I don't know what makes something calling because it's a quality of life issue and what is calling because you are, you've decided to move in above or next to or near a bar and now you're calling 311 all the time. But the bar was always there. The restaurant was always there. The comedy club was always there. You decided to move in and now you're trying to shut down a business by calling 311 repeatedly. But I think we know when we are using 311 as a tool to a non-emergency complaint, and when we're using it to, I don't, I see again, the language that I have is the language of films. Rat out somebody, snitch on somebody. These are not my words. These are the words I learned watching television and movies. And again, it's a matter of finding, like, the right things to call about. I'm sure they're busy as well. And 911 is busy. But we have to find a way to clean the streets and make them safe, right? And in in, in order for a street to be safe, the sidewalks have to have no trip hazards. And again, once you start looking for it and noticing it, you realize, wow, there is a lot of trip hazards, a lot of cracked sidewalks. They can be patched with concrete, but it'll never be the same as jackhammering up the concrete, putting down new rebar, pouring concrete, leveling it. You know, And again, I understand, you know, I'm a tenant, I'm not a landlord. So a landlord may say, look, I don't have the money. I'm land rich, cash poor. Okay, but you own a building, so you might have to borrow against the building to fix your sidewalk. The sidewalk is your responsibility. I believe that's the rules the city has established. The city couldn't take care of every sidewalk in the five boroughs. That has to be relegated to the landlord who owns the building. And again, somehow it has to be enforced. And I think that would also be a good way to do good and do well and create jobs. Now, who would be, I don't even think there's enough people doing concrete work if we actually made something that said, look, you have 90 days to fix your sidewalks. If you don't and we come and see it, we were going to start giving tickets. We believe these are good tickets and we believe that good tickets are beneficial to the city because it encourages you, quote unquote, to fix the sidewalk. Otherwise, there'll be a penalty. Now, even if you gave a ticket of $1,000 every month, somebody might say, it's cheaper for me to pay this ticket for three years 
than to do $75,000 in concrete work. That may be the case. Someone may say it's not worth it to fix my sidewalk. I'd rather just pay the ticket. One of the things that's happening soon is they're going to, I believe, ask people who put up sheds during the pandemic to take them down from, I believe, maybe the end of November to March. But again, this is something that's been passed by people in politics, local politics, who have no idea what it takes to put one of these up, maintain it, and then take it down and store it where and why for four months. I'd rather you just come up with a rent, which is what's going to happen. You're going to charge rent for the people who've kept the sheds up, but really every shed that is up, not everyone, but most of them, represent a business that survived the pandemic. One of our businesses was shut down for 14 months. We survived. We made a deal with the landlord to pay back rent over the course of 18 months. And that's it. That's the best we could do. Even though we didn't make any money for 14 months, we still had to pay back half the back rent for the 14 months we were closed. So we lost any profit we could have made, any money we could have made, and we had to figure out a way to pay half of the rent as if we were open. But that's it. That's the life of landlords and tenants. The tenants usually, it's a game of shoots and ladders. And the tenants get the shoots and the landlords get the ladders. And that's life. That's the world we have right now until the aliens come here and they say, here's the way it's going to work from here on out. We have put this through our artificial intelligence. We are artificial intelligence. And we have figured out the perfect math formula, as pure to math as possible, of what rents should be everywhere. And it all depends on the space and the place and how much it was purchased for and what the monthly costs are and what the value has increased to. But then we would be like, look... This is the number given to us by the aliens or by artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is a form of an alien because it comes from an other world. We have created AI, but then AI now is learning on its own. So to some degree, isn't that an alien? And that's another thing I thought about. Like a lot of people have a name like, you know, Taylor Swift has Swifties. Um, Lady Gaga has My Little Monsters. I thought I may need something for the people who are interested in following me. And I thought because my name is Ali. And at some point I was an immigrant and a resident alien. Maybe the people who are interested in following me are aliens or aliens. But aliens sound pretty good. A-L-I-E-N-S. So it's got the first, first three letters of my name. My aliens. My little aliens. My beautiful aliens. Those of us. And, you know, also the immigrant population because we're the same. Neither of us can be the president of the United States. It doesn't mean you shouldn't get into politics if you have an aptitude for it and you have a desire to help. I believe do what you can and do it at a young age. And maybe if I'd gotten into politics instead of improvisation and comedy and acting early on, that's what I put my focus into. But it just wasn't in my mind's eye. I just never thought about being a politician. You know, we have to really delineate between the idea of something and the reality of it. Our latest venture is a piano bar performance venue with a kitchen. And it's struggling. It's a beautiful space. Um, it's food's amazing. We're not getting the customers. Because whether a recession has begun or not, something is up. And 29th between 6th or 7th is not an eating street. It's a commercial street, wholesale, retail, um, changed a little bit in the past two decades, but still people aren't just walking down the street looking for food. So it's been a struggle. So I have to make that difficult decision, sell it or surrender it. Surrender means you give the keys back to the landlord. You say, I'm sorry, I tried. They keep the security deposit and that's it. You get to walk away. I believe they call it a good guy guarantee. You're trying to be a good guy, give back the keys, not fight them, not have them go to court to kick you out. You lose your security deposit. You lose everything you invested to build it, but you at least get to walk away and reclaim that mental real estate. 
because right now it's taking up a lot of mental real estate. But it also taught me that I really do not want to be a part of a business that has a kitchen anymore. I, I thought I liked the idea of it. Um, but it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot to run a kitchen and God bless anybody who has a kitchen as part of their business. It's costly. Payroll's costly. Materials are costly. What you can charge is costly. You know, it's all very, very difficult. And that's why I have on my phone, my iPhoto, 500 for rent signs of businesses. You know, I would say more than half of them are restaurants. But I don't see how I could have not done it. It was just at a time where there was a fog of war where I felt like the microcosm informed the macrocosm and I needed to do something for New York City again. In the same way when I started the theater post 9-11 in 2002, I felt like this is my way to help New York. And it survived. You know, We also had to pay back rent because we were also closed for over a year. Um, and I thought the same way post-pandemic, I'm going to open up a little piano bar performance art space called Tin Pan Alley because this was area was known as Tin Pan Alley in the 1900s. And I hope people will come and it will work. And I just, I didn't crunch the numbers. I was just, I, it's hard to understand myself personally how off I could have been. Again, I, I came up in a world where Kevin Costner's film Field of Dreams really informed a lot of my life. If you build it, they will come. I believe that to be true. That's what happened with New York City. If you build it, they will come. A city like this was built, and people came from around the world to engage in this experiment in society and community and democracy and try businesses, you know, because it's New York City. And the, the thinking is, if our chicken sandwiches work here, then why not bring them to the biggest market, one of the biggest markets in America, and sell them there? And everything in New York City is an exchange of commercial property on the ground floor between one business and another. What I saw used to be a lot of small bodegas became nail salons. Now some nail salons are becoming vape shops. There is a lot of CBD and vape shops around the city now, taking up ground floor small spaces. Some that used to be retail, some that used to be wholesale. I don't know. Is there room for all of them? Potentially. I think, you know, eventually we have to head towards the complete legalization and decriminalization of drugs. We're spending too much time and energy putting people away for something that is, you know, essentially, hopefully, nonviolent and really affects them and their families. And we're about to legalize gambling and put a casino somewhere in the New York City area. Now, when that comes, that is going to bring a whole host of problems with it because then there's no saturation point. At least with drugs and alcohol, you are going to do them and then pass out and then be passed out for a while. With gambling, you're going to do it until you run out of money, then you're going to look for more money. And you're going to spend your whole days and nights finding money to go back to play the games, thinking you can win. But they don't build casinos to lose money. They build casinos to make money. Now, some say they're building them to make jobs, and they will create jobs. But they'll also cost jobs. They'll cost people their lives. Because gambling is seems so innocuous. But those who are drawn to it, you know, a lot of former athletes are drawn to it because it does to some degree replicate that endorphins, that adrenaline you feel as a former athlete when you're sitting at the table and your dopamines are kicking in because all of a sudden you've got the card you needed. You've got the roulette number you needed. Whatever it is, it feels that all of a sudden you're feeling and that's what we want. We want to feel alive. We want to feel something. And we don't want to feel that something taking a walk and starting to go from walking to running and that briskness and that, you know, taking a deep breath, that may not be enough. We don't want to feel something by drinking a glass of water and trying to visualize everybody in this world who does not have clean water today. And what a gift that is. We don't want that. We want, we want a split aces. We want to go in on two seven suited and try to pick up two sevens and a two on the flop. We want that feeling of hitting the lottery, of feeling lucky. 
another thing, and again, I don't know in no particular order, elections have to be on weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. This is something we have to do locally and nationally. And the reason we have to do them on Saturdays and Sundays is because some people use um, Saturdays as a day of worship and some people use Sundays as a day of worship. So we need to make sure we're taking everybody into account and once a year or whenever we have our elections, we do it on Saturdays and Sundays because doing it on a Tuesday not only hurts small business, but it also doesn't allow for people who work hourly to really vote because they may say like, look, I'd love to go vote, but this is going to cost me 45 50 $60 to go vote. And at some point the voting has to happen digitally. And I know that's going to be hard for people to stomach. Like, what do you mean? Voting on my phone? Yeah, in some secure, encrypted way, eventually people have to be able to vote in the easiest way possible. Whether they're calling on a number on their phone, whether they're voting on their phone, of course people are going to say there's room for error. And I think people think the only way there's not room for error is if you go in, you write on a piece of paper your vote, and we count that vote by hand. But plenty of elections were stolen that way as well. We just have to find the system where we make it as easy as possible for people to vote. As I've said, I believe the voting age should be dropped to 16 as well. If not younger, but 16 is viable. It's a conversation that can be had without people getting too crazy. You go down to 14, you're starting to make people think it's a science fiction movie. But we have to make voting easy as possible. We have to start taking things into account from the perspective of small business. Everything we do that hurts small business hurts ourselves. So when you have elections on a Tuesday, you think about all the small businesses that get hurt because people aren't able to come to work because they want to vote or people are not getting that egg and cheese on a roll, that salad in a bowl, that slice of pizza because they're not at work that day. So we have to start looking towards the easiest way possible. One thing that I, I just heard is happening, I believe Delta is doing this on their flights. They're loading the plane from the window seats first, then the middle seats, then the aisle seats. Now this to me is genius. And this idea could have been around since the beginning of flight. But no one thought about, you know what? Why don't we start dividing it up and boarding according to you're going to get in and you're going to go right to the window. You go before the guy who's going to be getting in before you and he's going to be on the aisle. Now he's got to get up. And apparently it saves two minutes of flight. Now you might think that's not a big deal, but that's huge in air travel. From the time a plane lands to the time it takes off, they have about 45 minutes. So if they can save two minutes per flight, but also make an easier, better experience for people who are um, traveling, it's genius to me. To me, this is one of those things where it's like, aha, uh -huh, how come nobody thought of this? In the same way that Oreo cookie basically had a chocolate cookie with a vanilla cream for 80 years. Didn't touch their product. And then all of a sudden, somehow they decided to double up the cream, add different flavors. Now, either somebody at Oreo got hired who may have partaken in some marijuana and had the munchies. And in that period of time, eating some Oreo cookies, started thinking, why not a mocha cream? Why not a, uh, a pumpkin cream? 80 years, we're just putting in chocolate cookie with vanilla cream. Why not double stuff? So sometimes we have to look for places where, hey, is there a better way to do this as opposed to the thinking of that's just always the way it's been done around here? We have to let go of that, that idea. That's always the way it's been done around here. There's a story, and again, I'd like to keep these under 30 minutes. There's a story about a piece of concrete on a military base that is guarded every night by two men who go back and forth around it in an L and it's been going on for 80 years and all of a sudden the new head of the base shows up and he goes well, why are these guys guarding this slab of concrete and the guy says I don't know it's just always the way it's been done here we just guard that slab of concrete he goes well I gotta look into this and see why he found out 80 years ago they poured the concrete the slab and because to make sure no one 
you know, made a mark in it. They had two guys guard the concrete slab for, I believe, a few weeks while it cured and became hard. Now, in that period of time, the head of the barracks, the military base, left. When the next guy came in, he just assumed this was something they did all the time. They guarded this piece of concrete every night from dusk to dawn. So for 80 years, two soldiers guarded a slab of concrete on a military base because that's just always the way it's been done here. Until someone asked, why? And when they found out why, it was unbelievable. They stopped guarding the slab of concrete. Now again, this could be an apocryphal story, meaning could be true, could not be true, but I heard it, so I take it at face value. But I think what's more important is the idea of it. The sense of, that's just always the way it's been done here. But why? I don't know. It's just how we do it. But why haven't you looked into a better way of doing it? I don't know. Right? But somebody in the airline industry looked into a better way. Now, the airline industry, you know, bless them, they are doing something. But they are also ones that, you know, we have to start charging for bags. I'm old enough to remember where you didn't get charged for a bag. You could bring two bags on board and a carry-on. And that was included in your plane ticket. Then at one point, they had to make this decision because of fuel costs. And all of a sudden, there was no going back. They saw how much they were making off bags. I don't know, probably $500, $600 million a year just in baggage fees. There's certain things, once they realize you're willing to pay it, they're they're not going to go back unless someone else goes back. And when someone else goes back, they have to chase back and go, all right, so-and-so has blinked. And now we're going back. It's just like the 99 cent slice of pizzas in New York City. Someone said, you know what? We know that a large cheese pizza costs about 2 to $3 in materials. And so we're going to sell the eight slices for a dollar a slice. And that'll be $8, but we'll sell more of them. It'll cost us two. We'll make $6 a pie. If we sell 100 pies, uh, 600 a day, is that enough? I don't know. Now those slices of pizzas are going away and they're becoming dollar fifty slices. The even the dollar slice of pizza in New York City is going away, and that used to be a way where you could feed to some degree, I don't want lower socioeconomic classes, people who were cash poor. They knew like if I could get a buck or two together, I can get two slices of cheese. I think it's important to figure out a way to how do we feed people? How do we make sure everyone has water? How do we make sure the air is clean in New York City? This all adds to that the clean streets is not just clean mailboxes and fire hydrants. It's clean air. Because, again, everything is kind of a distraction from global warming. Now, there are real crises out there right now. There are wars and genocide. The existential crisis, bigger than all of us, that includes all of us, is global warming. That is happening whether we want to believe it or not. And even if we don't believe it, let's pretend like it is. Let's pretend like it's happening and act as such, but people don't want to because it affects their bottom line because it's uncomfortable. But it's coming. And so I'm willing to do these alimonies and talk about my ideas and for whoever needs you know, 30 minutes of content to be able to clean their bathroom, take a walk, take a drive, And for whatever reason, my voice and the words I'm saying is turning them into an alien. Alien. I had a super in one of my buildings. His name was Alois Boric. He used to call me Alian. He was from Croatia. An amazing man. I couldn't have done the project on 24th Street without him. He was instrumental. I hope he's well wherever he is. But he used to call me Alian. I think that's an endearing way of calling someone, you know, uh, a name. Alian. Alian. Cut that pipe out. You don't need it. It's a dead pipe, Alian. Okay. All right. All right, Al. Let's keep cutting out the dead pipes, Alian. And we did. We cut out like 75 dead pipes in the basement of this building to make it nicer. Well, as I said, I don't want these things to go on longer than they need to. 29, 59 seems like a a nice length. I love New York City, and I hope New York City loves me. I truly want it to be the greatest city in the world with or without me. Because it's going to take every single New Yorker and every single alien.